Hello friends, my name is Lucas Mann. I'm the pastor of the Spring Church. It's a small church just about maybe 10 miles from here over in Lawrence. Perhaps many of you are from different places traveling down the interstate, but I'm grateful to God that I live so nearby that I can come here and share the gospel with you friends. And that's what I'm here ultimately to do is to preach the gospel, to tell you about Jesus Christ. The Bible says that God's gospel message is the power of God for salvation to those who believe it. Friends, I'm out here to seek a conversion to Christ, that you would believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. For He Himself said in John 3 that if you do not believe, then the wrath of God abides on you, friends, and I don't want that for you. So I come out here to tell you the message of life. The Bible describes the Gospel as the only way, the only way of salvation. And it is the offensive gospel. The gospel creates offense and it creates anger in the hearts of people because it calls them out in their sin. It calls them out in their rebellion. But it offers life. It offers restoration to God. It offers reconciliation. That's why the Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5 that the gospel is the word of reconciliation. It's the way that you can be made right with God. And so friends, I come out here because I care for your souls, especially standing out here in July heat. It's not the most comfortable thing in the world. But friends, I don't want you to perish in your sins and go to hell. I want you to be made right with God through Jesus Christ. The Bible says there is one mediator between God and man, and that is the man Christ Jesus. He is the anointed one. Even His very name means salvation. Yahweh saves. I'm out here also to call you out in your sin so that you will see your sin, that you will see your rebellion and see what it earns for you so that Christ will become worthy to you. He will become worthy for you to follow after Him, a worthy Savior, that He will be to you your precious salvation, your precious reconciliation to your Creator. And this text of Scripture that I would like to preach from is Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. And we're going to begin right in verse 1. The Apostle Paul says these words in Romans chapter 1 verse 1. He says, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. And friends, this is a very fitting text because that is precisely what I'm here to tell you about. That is the gospel of God. Notice he gives it that particular term. That it is of God, it is from Him, and for Him, and for His glory. And the title of this sermon is, Paul, set, uh, Paul a slave and set apart for the gospel. Paul a slave and set apart for the gospel. Friends, that is really a very important question you must answer. The most important question. Have you been set apart to believe the gospel? Has God set you apart and singled you out and given you faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you right with God? That's the question, the greatest of all questions that must be answered. And the Apostle Paul, someone who was the enemy of God for such a long time in his life and lived in rebellion to God and persecuted the church of God, yet he himself was reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. And I, my friends, personally can testify, along with what the Apostle Paul wrote, that these things are so. For it has come about in my own life that I was once lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. Once I was too dead in my sin. But God saved me from my sin and gave me life in Christ, and He can do the same for you. Scripture says that He is able to save to the uttermost to those who draw near to God through Him. The Apostle Paul writes these words at the outset of his gospel. His gospel message, his gospel presentation that he gives in the book of Romans. And he begins saying that he is set apart to preach that gospel. That's what Paul's life was about. Is your life about preaching the gospel and living on the gospel? That's what it's all about, friends. The message of eternal life through Jesus Christ. That was what Paul lived and, and was persecuted for and ultimately killed for. All of Jesus' disciples except one were martyred 
for what they believed. Because they truly believed the message of the Gospel. And friends, they understood that it is the only thing that can save you. What is that message? It's the message of Jesus' death and burial and resurrection. You know, in Paul's day, in, in Paul's culture, people, especially in ancient, ancient Rome and in ancient Greece, people followed so many different religions, so many different beliefs, and really nothing's changed in our modern day. People have so many different beliefs. In fact, uh, there's a common belief that's now adopted, especially in the West, called postmodernism, which basically states that everyone can believe whatever they want because truth is a relative idea. It's something that if, if it's true for you, then it's true for you. And whatever's true for me is true for me. And everybody can just have their own truth. Everyone can have their own cake and eat it. But friends, truth by its nature is absolute and it applies to everyone. It applies to all people. And the Gospel is such the same. It applies to everyone. In fact, Scripture describes God as the God with whom you must do. In other words, you must deal with Him one way or another, one day or another, either today or the day of judgment. And if it's a day of judgment, it will be too late. But friends, there is total forgiveness, there is total salvation through Jesus Christ and in Him alone. So there's two things I would like us to look at in this text of Scripture. And that is that Paul was a slave of Christ and that Paul was set apart for the Gospel. Paul was a slave of Christ and he was set apart for the Gospel. Let's look at the first one. Paul was a slave of, jo of Christ Jesus. He writes, Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus... The Greek word that he employs there in this text is doulos, which means a slave. He was a slave of Jesus Christ. See, friends, I want to tell you this. You're either a slave to your sin or you're a slave to Jesus Christ. You're either a slave to iniquity or into righteousness. There's no halfway in or halfway out. So many people will say, well, you know, I know that I need to get right with God, but one day I'll do it. As if their sin is something they could just flip on and off like a switch. Friends, the Bible says if you're outside of Jesus Christ, that you're a slave to your sin, that you cannot stop sinning. My friends, only the grace of God can, can free you from your, from your rebellion, from your slavery, and can make you to become a slave of Jesus Christ. And it's, it's an interesting dichotomy, because when you become a slave of Jesus Christ, when you become a slave for righteousness, then you are truly free. The one who is a slave of Christ is truly free indeed. Also, what's interesting is the word doulos here in the Greek was used in the ancient Roman world to describe both slaves who were slaves voluntarily and involuntarily. In other words, some slaves chose to be slaves and others did not. And it's so true for the Christian that they themselves, we don't choose to be saved. God just saves those whom He wills but at the same time, when you're born again, when God regenerates you, you trust on Christ. You're responsible to believe the message. So friends, the question is, are you a slave of Jesus Christ or a slave to your own sin? And the only way you can be set free from slavery to your sin is by believing the Gospel. Because he says down in verse 16 of this same chapter, he says, For I am not ashamed of the Gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. In fact, in the 6th chapter of Romans, he says this, verse 5 of Romans 6, he says, For we have been united to Him, with Him, excuse me, in the likeness of His death. Certainly we shall also be in the likeness of His resurrection, knowing that our old self was crucified with Him, in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. Friends, are you freed from your sins, or are you a slave to your sin? Many people are living in slavery to sin, and I, I can testify to this personally, that I myself was in total bondage for years of my life, addicted to pornography and drunkenness and partying and speaking in a worldly way, using foul language. 
And it was so crazy because I thought I was free and I thought I was cool, but that's all I could do. I couldn't free myself from those things. I could not stop looking at porn. I couldn't stop speaking the way that I was speaking. Living the life that I was living. I was a slave to sin. But when God came into my life and regenerated me, that's a big word, simply means to be recreated. He saved me. He gave me faith in the Gospel. And now I'm freed from those things, no longer a slave, and I can put to death the deeds of the flesh. Friends, even if you claim to be a Christian, if you live in rebellion to God, not, I'm not saying perfection, sinless perfection, but I'm saying if you live in rebellion to God, and you claim to be a Christian, you go to church, you sing the hymns, you listen to the preacher, you say nice things to Him, and you think you're okay. But friends, if you live in habitual sin then you yourselves are unconverted and outside of Christ. You perhaps may say that you're a Christian. You may say that you've been born again. But friends, it's not what you say. It's how you live. Your actions determine truly what you believe. See friends, right now, those of you who are outside of your cars and you're standing on the pavement, you have faith and you have a firm belief that the pavement's going to hold you up. You wouldn't be standing on it if you didn't. And friends, it is exactly the same way with the Gospel. If you have firm faith in God and in the Gospel of Jesus Christ, you will stand upon it. You will live your life in accordance to the will of God. Friends, don't lose your souls for your sin. No sin is worth perishing in hell for. No sin is worth going to hell for, friends. In fact, the most joyful life that you can live is a life in self-denial, in self-forgetting, and living for the glory of Jesus Christ. Because you're ultimately not living for this life, but you're living for the life which is to come. You're living for glory. And Paul understood this. Paul did not live an easy life. He lived a life of hardship, and he was persecuted for the name of Jesus Christ. Oftentimes we see these prosperity preachers on, on, the, on the television, the televangelists. Joel Osteen and those other false teachers will talk about how you've got to be healthy and wealthy. It's your best life now. Friends, Jesus, His apostles, the Apostle Paul, they didn't live easy lives. They lived hard lives. In the world's eyes, they were, they were cursed of God. But dear friends, genuine blessedness from God is if you confess the Lord Jesus Christ, if you follow after Jesus Christ. That is genuine blessedness. That is true blessedness from God. If you are in union with Christ, if you are in union with the Son of God, do you know Jesus Christ? And does Christ Jesus know you? Has Christ purchased you out of slavery to sin? See friends, in ancient Rome, slaves were purchased by their masters as property. And oftentimes, sadly, even treated as such. Friends, the question I have for you is, has Christ purchased you out of slavery to sin? In other words, is your hope founded upon the death of Jesus Christ on the cross to buy you out of slavery to sin? Is your hope built on Jesus Christ? Or is your hope for heaven built on yourself? My friends, those who trust in themselves will come to complete ruin. If you trust in any merit, if you trust in any righteousness of your own, then you'll perish in your sins. But if you trust upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you trust that He died for your sin, and you trust that He rose again, and that He has given you His perfect righteousness, then friends, you have hope, true hope, the hope of glory. So many people are religious, but they're not converted. So many people go to church, but they're not converted. So many people say prayers, but they're not converted. True Christianity, true salvation, is trust upon the Lord Jesus Christ alone. You cannot earn your way to heaven, friends. Do not believe the lie of the Roman Catholic Church. Don't believe the lie of the Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses. You can only be made right with God through Christ and through Him alone. 
In fact, 500 years ago was an amazing event, one of the most glorious things that has ever happened in the history of the world. And that was where God raised up men called the Reformers and they began what is now called the Protestant Reformation. And they had five phrases in the Protestant Reformation that they dubbed in Latin. And one of them is Solus Christus. That is Latin for Christ alone. My friends, the question is, is your hope in Christ alone? Is your hope in Jesus Christ or in yourself? The proverb says that riches will not profit on the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. Friends, are you trusting in your religious duty or your penance? Are you trusting in your wealth? Are you trusting in your place in society? Or are you trusting upon Jesus Christ alone and in His perfect righteousness given to you as a gift of grace? So that's the first part of this verse. Let's look at the second part where he says, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. Paul was specifically set apart to be an apostle, and then he even goes further and says, I was set apart for the gospel. In other words, he was set apart to preach the gospel. My friends, have you been set apart by God to believe the gospel message? You ask me, well, Lucas, I'm not sure. I'm not sure whether I am right with God. We'll simply believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. And then you will know that you have been set apart. Then you will know that you've been chosen by God to believe the gospel message, to believe the good news of Jesus Christ. Simply trust in Him and you will know the divine guarantee will be given to you. And notice he says the gospel. In other words, that's what he believed. That's what he confessed. And friends, that's ultimately what I'm out here to tell you about. That Jesus Christ is Lord. Thank you for your service, sir. God bless you. We need to pray for our, the, our officers. We need to pray for their protection. Friends, I want to tell you this part. This is the most important part. And that is the gospel message. So Paul says he's set apart by God to preach the gospel. Well, we ask, what is the gospel? What is the good news? That's what the word gospel means. And he, uh, Greek is euangelion. It's good tidings. In fact, uh, during the Christmas season, there's a song that's often sung where they say, good tidings for Christmas and a happy new year. There's a, it's a joyful time of the year. And my friends, uh, the gospel is the greatest of all tidings. The greatest of all good news. The most precious treasure seated far above every treasure on the face of the earth. It is the pearl of great price. It is the summit of all things. It is the most glorious news story you will ever hear. The message of Jesus Christ. But my friends, I want to first present to you what the bad news is. And that is, this may shock you, that God is good. That is bad news. You may ask, is it bad because God is good in and of Himself? Intrinsically, no, that's not the issue. But the issue is found in us because in light of who God is, we are woefully inadequate. We are woefully sinful. God is a holy God. The Bible says that God is a consuming fire. And we are sinners. We have fallen short of His glory. In other words, God's standard of perfection is way up here. It is beyond even the tallest of mountains. God's standard is the highest standard. In fact, no man can even begin to own up or even stand up to his standards of righteousness. God bless you, sir. Thank you. Friends, God is so pure and so holy, so righteous. It is true that He is gracious and abounding in loving kindness, as the Scriptures say, that He loves sinners. We see that daily, my friends, even you yourselves being here. That's a testimony to God being loving toward you and giving you life. But I never want to take away from the fact that God is a just judge. His law has been broken by us. The sinners, the guilty, the lawbreakers. And because of our law breaking before God, because of our rebellion against the Most High, we are guilty. God said you shall not lie. God said that you shall not steal. 
God said that you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. God said you shall not commit adultery. God bless you, sir. Friends, God has put forth His law. But here is the problem. Herein lies the issue. Is we cannot keep it. We lie. We've stolen. We've blasphemed God's name. Many of you have committed adultery. In fact, Jesus comes along in Matthew 5 and says, if you so look with lust, if you look at another human being with sexual lust, you commit adultery in the heart. My friends, God is so righteous, He must punish sin. And so that is why hell exists. That is why hell exists, my friends. Hell is a real place. Jesus talked more about hell than He did heaven. In fact, Jesus said that hell is a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus said that hell is the place of outer darkness. Jesus said that hell is the place of eternal punishment. In other words, it never ends. It just continues on. So we are left, in light of this truth, without hope. We are left in and of ourselves, condemned and eternally lost. And there's nothing we can do to reconcile ourselves to the judge. But dear friends, the mercy of God is so great that it overcomes sin. And God sent His Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus came and He lived a perfect life. Jesus came and fulfilled God's holy law. Those commandments that we break, He fulfills. He comes and He fulfills all of them. He never lies. He never steals. He never blasphemes. He never looks with lust. He never breaks the Sabbath. He's absolutely perfect in His life. And then He goes to the cross and He is stretched upon that cross and nailed to it. And before that, He was whipped and beat. He was mocked. The Bible says He was even abandoned by His own followers that night before His crucifixion. And then He is put upon the cross and God the Father does something glorious. The Bible says that upon the cross, Jesus Christ underwent the wrath of God against sinful humanity. In other words, God treated Jesus as if He had committed the sin that we've committed. God unleashed upon Jesus Christ the full fury of His judgment and His wrath. See, the Gospel is not just about God's mercy and grace, but it's about God's judgment and wrath. That God hates sin with such a vengeance He must bring upon the sinner judgment. And instead of doing that, He puts it on His Son. He puts His wrath upon the innocent one. The one who never broke the law. Isaiah 53.10 says it very clearly when it says in verse, uh, at the beginning of verse 10 that it pleased the Lord to crush him. And then it says if he would render himself as a guilt offering. In other words, Christ died to take away our guilt before God. So we stand in the courtroom, or I should say it better, we stand in the courtroom and we are pronounced guilty and we are put on death row for having broken the law and we are without hope. But Christ comes and He takes our place on death row and He dies the death that we deserve. And therefore we are free to leave the courtroom. We are free to walk out forgiven and totally cleansed by the judge. That is the gospel message. That is the message which will save your soul from sin. God bless you, sir. Which will save your soul eternally. And then not only did he die, but he rose from the grave on the third day. Jesus Christ could not remain in the grave, for he himself is the way and the truth, and the life. Listen to the testimony of Luke, who wrote the Gospel of Luke. He says in verse 1 of Luke 24, But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, there came to the tomb, excuse me, they came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. When... 
While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men suddenly stood near them in dazzling clothing. And the women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground. The men said to them, Why do you seek the living one among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. Remember how he spoke to you while he was in Galilee, saying that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and on the third day rise again. How glorious that is. Not only did Jesus die for the sins of God's people and then rise from the dead on the third day, but he told his disciples beforehand that he was going to do that. That he foretold that event. And my friends, I can say with the uttermost certainty that Jesus has risen from the dead. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And the Bible says that he will never die again. God bless you, sir. And my friends, what I invite you and what I challenge you and plead with you to do this day is to flee your sin, is to flee the vanity fair that you have been living in is to flee your lust and your pornography, to flee your adultery, to flee your drunkenness and your drug abuse, to flee your selfishness, to flee your pride, to flee your hatred of God and your hatred of your fellow man, and to cling to the Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing in my hand I bring, but simply to the cross I cling, as the old hymn puts it. Friends, cling to the cross as your only hope of forgiveness before God. Come to Jesus Christ. And He says that He will never cast anyone out who comes to Him. See, friends, Jesus says He's not going to cast you out. And He's never casted anyone out. But the problem is, is people are so prideful and so self-concerned and self-consumed and self-righteous that they would rather trust in themselves. They would rather live for themselves. They would rather not take up their cross and not deny themselves and then die in hell eternally. Perish in their sins eternally. Friends, don't lose your soul. Jesus said that if any man is to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and come after me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. For what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul. Friends, if you gained all the riches in this world today, if you met all the great celebrities, if you had perfect health, and you had a great political career, or you were some wonderful celebrity that everyone liked, my friends, if, what if you gained all that, and then you died and you went to hell? What would that profit you? In the end, where would you be? You'd be poor and miserable and wretched eternally. But my friends, what if you live this life undergoing disappointment after disappointment and hardship after hardship, trusting upon the finished work of Jesus Christ for your salvation and believing the promises of God as Abraham did? Then that day that your eyes close in death and you awake in glory, you will eternally reside with the Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, I beg you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God through Jesus. And that is why I say repent and believe the gospel. In the words of my Lord, in Luke, or excuse me, in Mark chapter 1 verse 15, Jesus said these words, "The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel." Dear friends, the Bible says if you are born again, the love of God is shed abroad in your heart. What a precious, glorious reality that is. Friends, so many people live in self-love. You know, we have so many philosophies that talk about that these days. Gurus talking about self-discovery, self-acceptance, self-love, blah, 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 mushy-gushy. But Jesus comes along and He says, deny yourself and take up your cross daily and come after Me. Friends, true joy is found in self-forgetting, not self-fulfilling. Self-denial and not self-fulfillment. Friends, it's not about you. It's about living your life to the glory of God. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10.31, whatever you do, do to the glory of God. 
And certainly many people, even here at, the, at this place, are not living for the glory of God. But friends, if you turn from your sins and you believe the gospel, something so glorious happens. God forgives you of your sins. God wipes away your iniquities. God can justly let you go. Listen to the words of Jesus Christ to His disciples at the end of Luke in Luke 24. He says, Thus it is written, this is in Luke 25, or excuse me, in Luke 24, verse 45. He says, Thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead on the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in His name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. Friends, you can receive forgiveness of your sins today. You can receive total pardon today, right now. You don't have to muster up any goodness. You don't have to prepare yourself. Just come. Don't even worry about trying to stop sinning because you can't. Come to Jesus that He might free you from your sins. You don't stop sinning to come to Jesus. You come to Jesus to stop sinning because He will, by His own power, enable you and free you. For Jesus Himself said in John 8 that the Son, when He sets you free, you will be free indeed. True freedom is only found in Christ alone. And not only will God forgive you of your sins if you trust in Christ, but God will clothe you in the righteousness of Christ. In other words, God will treat you as having lived Jesus' life, as having fulfilled the law, as Jesus Himself did, as having done all the perfect things that Jesus did. God will look upon you as if you did that. God will credit to you His Son's own righteousness. This is what theologians have called the great exchange. This is the greatest of all trade deals. This is the greatest of all deals. This is the greatest deal that you can possibly find. That God is willing to take your sin away in exchange for right, the righteousness of Christ. That God is willing to wash away your sins and give you perfect eternal life in Jesus Christ. That God is willing to wrap you in the righteousness of Christ if you will simply come to Him. Friends, believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved as Acts 16.31 says. Friends, come to Christ and live. You who are young, come. You who are young and old, come. You who are wealthy, you who are poor, come and have riches in Jesus Christ. Have eternal riches in Jesus Christ. You who have nothing, come and receive eternal life. I'm not like the prosperity gospel preachers on TBN or the televangelists who are going to tell you that Jesus will make your life easy or Jesus will make your life all happy. Jesus promises eternal life, not an easy life. Jesus promises life for the life which is to come. That's what Jesus promises. Not an easy living here. So many preachers say, well, you're having a hard time, you have an issue with your marriage, you don't have joy, you don't have peace. Well, come to Jesus. He'll be rid you of your problems. It is true that Jesus will give you joy and peace and Jesus can help your marriage. He can heal your marriage. But that's not the reason you ought to come. You ought to come to bring God glory through Him. Bring God glory, my friends, through Jesus Christ. Give God glory for what He has done for you and for me in Christ. The offer of salvation is extended to all the peoples of the world. The word is come. Come and drink freely. Come and have life eternally. And I want to give a word of challenge unto you who claim to be followers of Jesus Christ. I want to give a challenge to you out there who perhaps claim to believe upon Jesus Christ for your salvation. 
I want to challenge you concerning this point and ask you the simple question, are you genuinely converted? Are you a genuine convert to Jesus Christ? For He Himself said in Matthew 7, He said, Not everyone who says to Me, Lord, Lord, this is verse 21, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of My Father, who is in heaven, will enter. Many will say to Me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in Your name? And in your name perform many miracles. And in your name cast out demons. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Friends, I say this because I care for you. Examine yourselves to see whether you be in the faith. If you claim to be a Christian, look at your life. Look at the way you live. Look at your thought life. Look at the way you talk. Look at your affections. Have you been changed? Has God done a work in you? Or are you self-deceived? Are you just claiming to be a Christian and you just want forgiveness from God? But that's all you want. You don't want to serve Christ. You don't desire holiness. You don't desire to honor Him in your life. Then that is surely a mark of a false conversion of someone who is genuinely not a Christian. I challenge you on this point to examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. To honestly look at your life and question, am I a genuine Christian? Friends, I myself for years said I was a Christian. I said I was born again. I said I had believed upon Christ. But I lived in rebellion and lived in constant habitual sin. Listen to the words of the Apostle John in 1 John 2. He says, By this we know that we have come to know Him. This is verse 3. If we keep His commandments, the one who says, I have come to know Him and does not keep His commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps His word in him, the love of God has been truly perfected. By this we know that we are in Him. The one who says he abides in Him ought himself also to walk in the same manner as he walked. Friends, are you like Jesus Christ? Do you live a life in conformity to the image of Christ? Or are you a hypocrite? My friends, God sees your internet browsing history. God sees what your wife cannot see. God sees what your girlfriend cannot see. God sees your mind, my friends. He sees the perverted thoughts that go through your mind. And He will judge you. The Bible says God will judge evildoers. For those of you who are claiming to be Christians and live in rebellion to God and you live in habitual sin and think yourselves to be saved, the Apostle Paul wrote words to people who claim to be Christians as well. Listen to this in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. The Apostle says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And then notice the next verse in verse 11. Such were some of you. My friends, if you're a born-again Christian, God has freed you from your sins. God has saved you from slavery to sin and has brought you to become a slave of Christ. And therefore you are like the Corinthians who were these things previously in their previous life, but now they have been given new life in Christ. And he says, Such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of our God. Friends, has God cleansed you of your sin? And I plead with you to examine yourselves, those of you who say you're Christians, and you're truly not. And to be therefore truly reconciled to God. Actually, really reconciled to God. Again, I exhort you, if you're outside of Christ, come to Him today. And if you are claiming to be a Christian, look at yourself and ask yourself, truly, am I saved? 
And if not, then turn from hypocrisy. Because there's a special place in hell for hypocrites. And turn to Christ alone. So we have seen here in this precious text of Scripture that the, Paul the Apostle was set apart and called to be a slave of Jesus Christ. And he was set apart for the gospel message of Jesus Christ. Friends, please believe the gospel of salvation. I care for you. I love you. I would not come out here, stand out here in July heat in these pants and tell you this, my friends, if I did not care for you and if I did not love you. Friends, I want your eternal souls to be redeemed. So I say, come to Christ. Come to God through His Son, Jesus Christ, and give Him glory. As I said earlier, give God the glory because the Gospel is so glorious that Jesus died for sin and rose again, that He was slain under the wrath of God on behalf of the people of God, that He fulfilled all righteousness, that He rose from the dead, and He gives that righteousness to all of His people, for all who confess Christ and trust in Him. He gives them perfect righteousness. That is such a glorious reality. And a life-saving reality. So give God glory for it. Give God the glory for, Je for what Jesus has done. And friends, I want to leave off with these words of encouragement to those perhaps who are out here who are genuine believers. Listen to these words of the Apostle Peter in 1 Peter 5. He says, After you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who called you to His eternal glory in Christ will Himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To Him be dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen and amen. God bless you.